All right. Um, so we are live now. Um, and today we are gathered here with our four uh, experts on uh, the experts that are trying to study the life on Mars in different aspects. So first we have uh, Stephen Benner. Um, hi, Stephen. Maybe you can introduce yourself, uh, a bit of your work, and then we can go on to the other three guests. Hi, Jitender. I'm, I'm the head of the Foundation for Applied Molecular Evolution, which among other things, is interested in the origins and evolution of life on Earth, but of course in the cosmos in general. So we do a lot of work studying how life would have originated on Earth or on Mars by interactions between organic chemicals and the rocks and minerals that are present on those surfaces. Fascinating. And uh, so, I mean, we, we already had one conversation in the past with Stephen Banner and like we discussed different aspects of his work. Um, but then now the second guest that we have is Jan Spacek. Uh, so kudos to him. He actually uh, put many efforts to put this thing together. So thank you. So Jan, can you please describe your work a little bit? Uh, hi, I'm Jan Spacek. Um, I work now for Steven at the uh, Foundation for Applied Molecular Evolution, and I work on two projects. One is uh, concerned with Venus. I'm looking for organics in uh, Venus clouds. So Venus is a sulfuric acid cloud, and I've made a prediction that there will be organics uh, making the cloud looking a little bit yellow. And second part is uh, looking for life on Mars. I started uh, team of astrobiologists uh, to look for life on Mars before we send humans there. The, the group is called Alpha Mars. So that's why I invited or asked you to invite us for this conversation. Interesting. And uh, I mean, of course, it'll be also interesting to know how uh, you are planning to manage all the all the work or uh, or achieve what you want to achieve so let's we'll we'll discuss about that later as well um so the next guest that we have is Catherine Majori is it correct uh, yes Majori perfect yeah so how do you um so how how can you explain your work what you are trying to do and uh, how it is linked to the life on mars Sure. So thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Catherine Majori. I'm a postdoc researcher at Georgetown University. Um, I just finished my PhD and I was working on uh, life detection methods in Mars analog environments. So I'm a microbiologist, microbial ecologist by trade. Um, I look at lots of extreme environments and specifically at, at uh, DNA and hopefully uh, eventually poly electrolytes large, more largely uh, as a biosignature and nanopore sequencing as a method to detect them. Uh, I got involved with Alpha Mars after meeting Jan at a workshop one or two years ago. Um, and I very much agreed with his uh, assertion that we should be looking for life on Mars before, before it's too late. So very happy to be involved with Alpha Mars and uh, happy to be here. Yeah, it's it's exciting, and um, and of course, I mean, in general, once we think of life, we just look at I don't know the species and the people that we have around us, but uh, the kind of uh, species that you are studying, the organisms that you are studying, it's it's quite exciting, and uh, uh, of course, I think it'll be interesting for for people to know uh, the the kind of conditions life can survive. So that's that's exciting, and. Um, on the sim similar lines, uh, we have next guest, which is Miguel Fernandez. Is it, is it correct? Yeah, that's perfect. That's perfect. Hi, uh, Hi everyone. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for having me here in this discussion. Really excited of being part of this discussion as well as I'm excited of being part of uh, Alpha Project ruled by, by Steven and, and Jean. Um, yeah, as, as you said, I'm similar to Catherine. I'm a microbial ecologist. I'm... I'm a researcher now, postdoctoral researcher in Universidad Autónoma de Madrid here in Spain. And I'm focused more in, in extreme environments in the microbial communities that you can find there and different uh, ways of trying to describe them as sequencing and different other uh, biosignature detections. Um, we can say that I'm especially focused on the, on the microbial ecology from polar regions as they also are similar to, to the regions that we can find in other planets like Mars or even in the icy moons and this kind of, of, of bodies outside Earth on the solar system. 
I think Miguel should have said that he just returned from uh, South Pole, <laughs> from <laughs> Antarctica, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, not not quite the South Pole, but yes, from Antarctica. <laughs> yeah, I, I returned on the 20th of March after a month there, yes, making some field experiments and field sampling and these kind of things. Yeah, I think with all the description, um, I mean, of course, people might be thinking that, okay, how all this is connected with Mars. Uh, but that's, I think, the, the that's our kind of job to explain why Mars and uh, what sort of geology it has and how all of your work fits into the picture. So, so let's start with this major question, why Mars, why it is so important? I mean, we have so much poetry written, literature written for moon. I mean, why, why did you have to go with Mars? I mean, <laughs> what's wrong with you guys? <laughs> so, uh, so why Mars? What, what is so important about the planet? So I would say there are two reasons. One, uh, from our solar system, I believe that Mars is the, is the second most likely place where to find life aside from Earth. Uh, second reason, we are time limited. As uh, Catherine mentioned before, uh, we might soon have uh, humans walking on Mars and we have a limited time window where we can study Mars uh, in its pristine condition. So although we could send probes to Europa, send them to other places in our solar system, those places will stay the same for same unchanged for next couple of centuries. Only Mars is going to be uh, likely colonized by humans in this century. So we have only limited time window and that's why we need to focus on, focus on it now. And if I may emphasize here, yeah, go ahead. I, I was just gonna uh, add, uh, in addition to the, to the urgency, which is totally true and important um there's also been some uh past meteoritic exchange between between earth and mars lots of past exchange between our planets so it's not there yep black beauty <laughs> so it's uh there's always the possibility that some kind of earth microbe hitched a ride to mars that way and seeded some kind of life that diverged you know four billion years ago so it, it's possible that there is something there and that we haven't uh been looking uh the right ways yet so idea of the panspermia well at least exactly. in the inside of a solar system but just tender one of the things that jan and Catherine are assuming and it's very important that your readers understand this or your listeners if humans arrive on mars they will bring or we will bring with us a large amount of earth life including of course the astronauts themselves so the concern is that Martian life is rather sparse because the availability of energy and resources to maintain a dense biosphere is just not there, especially water. So the concern is that human arrival will bring a lot of Earth life, which will not necessarily kill the Martian life. It will not necessarily uh, make the Martian life go extinct, but it will likely obscure our ability to detect sparse Martian life among a large human life backbone. And part of the reason for that is because when we look for life, when we humans look for life on another planet, we tend to look for the life that sort of looks like us. So we will already be biased to look for Earth-like life. And if we bring a lot of it, it's going to be a lot more difficult to see sparse, perhaps quite alien in terms of biochemistry life beneath that human signature. That's why Catherine and Jan are talking about the urgency of this mission. Interesting. And and Miguel, so if we if we'll not be looking uh, for life like us, then what kind of life are we looking at at Mars? Well, the thing uh, um, behind all this is that well, um, we are looking for similar uh, structures as we have here on Earth because it's uh, what we have found. We know that uh, there's life on Earth, of course. So. The main idea is that, well, if not the same, it's not exactly the same, even if we had uh, this panspermia uh, theory and being true, like exchanging uh, microbes from one place to the other, from one planet to the other. But still, we think that the, the life we have here is the best, uh, they, it has the best structure to um, be into the game of evolution. What I mean is like, um, well, uh, everything that resembles the life that we have here, even if it's not, I'm trying to be um, repeating this all the time. 
even if it's not exactly the same, but it's similar, is the best chance we have to have the evolution going on. What I mean is that, well, in physics, you have like um, general laws that uh, runs all the universe. Same for chemistry. What about biology? Something that we have discussed uh, a lot in, in biology. Is there any, any force that is that could be universal? And in my opinion, the, the force that rule that runs all the all life in the universe, if it's if it's something there outside Earth, is evolution. Evolution is a general force for everyone. So this is the this is the thing that we, we have to look for. Similar structures that will probably have the best chance to go into evolution and, and support the, the, the life on different on different planets or different bodies. I, I bet that Stephen is now itching to explain his <laughs> theory of well, <laughs> briefly, briefly. One of the things we do here is called synthetic biology, where we actually go into the laboratory and using chemistry, make alternative forms of matter that can support Darwinian evolution. So we have spent a lot of time showing that it's not just DNA or for that matter, RNA that can support processes of random variation followed by selection to give new function, but there are other molecular structures that can do so as well. So um, you got to keep in mind, there are many ways of looking for life. <clears throat> if you do a chemical search, you have to consider the fact that alternative chemistries uh, are able to support Darwinian evolution, which of course is, as, as Miguel was saying, a university, but a universal rather. But the idea here is that we can find through synthetic biology, many kinds of alternative structures that do work. We also know ones that do not work. And so as Catherine mentioned a moment ago, there, there is one or two universals in the informational molecules that will be followed as laws across the entire cosmos. And that is that the informational molecule will have to have a repeating charge, positive or negative. You have a repeating charge that is negative in your DNA, but that's uh, does not exclude repeating positive charges, which will also work. And that, that the building blocks in the that informational molecule all have to have the same size and shape so that when you exchange them by a mutation, you don't change their sizes and shapes. So when we have what is called an agnostic life finder, which has the acronym ALF, A-L-F, agnostic life finder, what we do when we do this molecularly, we go looking for molecules that have the generic informational structures of required for an informational polymer, which can be the same or different from what we have on Earth. Yeah, and what's important about this, when we are, we are looking for molecules that are necessary to support evolution, instead of looking for molecules that might be produced by evolution. So looking for polyelectrolytes, which are uh, aperiodic crystals, uh, Schrodinger's aperiodic crystals is the only way how to be sure that we are actually looking for biosignatures that are universal. If you look for, for example, for chlorophyll and you don't find chlorophyll on Mars, you cannot conclude that there is no life because Martians simply might not be using chlorophyll. And that applies for every biosignature, which is not necessary for evolution. So Martians don't need to have the same uh, structures as we know from life on Earth. They can be different, but they must have genetic polymers. For evolution. For evolution, yeah. Because evolution is the only way how you can make and sustain life, um, so. Yeah, and so um, this is exciting and um, because we can look at um, this thing at like with different perspectives, right? I mean, uh, so you are looking for molecules which are um, crucial for uh, Darwinian evolution, but then the other aspect is that how much um, environmental conditions will play a role in uh, for the origin of that kind of molecule, right? I mean, um, so one aspect that you mentioned is the wa water is important. And uh, so is there water on Mars? Or are there reports already? Yeah, there's plenty of water of Mars. Currently, it's mostly frozen. Uh, we know from radar, uh, orbiting radar images uh, that uh, basically from 40 degrees north towards pole and like 50 degrees uh, south towards south pole, you have this water table, subsurface uh, ice. Uh, so you have 
a lot of water on Mars, but Mars used to be a uh, water world uh, in its beginning. Uh, Three billion years ago, there were rivers, uh, lakes on Mars. We have now very strong evidence from Perseverance from Jezero Crater, which is studying the ancient delta. So we are certain that in the past, when life was origi originating on Earth, uh, Mars was a water world, and maybe it was water world before Earth was. So actually, life might have originated on Mars and then be transported to Earth, which is what Stephen actually believes in, because well, I don't. I don't believe it necessarily. It could. Go, it could have gone either way. But yes, there. There is one of the great advantages or discoveries of astrobiology over the past decade or two. And Miguel, of course, is an international expert in this and contributed to it. We have learned that life can survive quite well in cold water that is from time to time perhaps thawed, and so. There's no question that uh, on Mars, at the latitudes that Jan mentioned, and you know this among other things because if a meteorite hits Mars, you can see the ice that is displayed. Or if there's a, a, a cliff on Mars and then it collapses, you can see a layer of ice. There's no question that if, if that ice were on Earth, it would be infected by microbes and they would live it, not necessarily in what you and I would consider to be in style, but they do quite well from time to time. So the question really you have is, as Jan mentioned, three billion years ago when life is originating on Earth or on Mars or both, there is water on the surface. The question that you have to ask is whether, and this is the Jurassic Park, does life find a way to survive large changes, or at least what we think are large changes in the planetary environment. Now, on Earth, you had a large change in the planetary environment through the formation of all of this oxygen in the air. Earth is a much more oxidizing place than it was three billion years ago, and life had to adapt because oxygen is to primitive life likely quite toxic. On Mars, it's a lot drier than it was and a lot colder than it was. So the question is whether you think life found a way to survive that, but I'll let Miguel talk more about this. But you know, I mean, there's no question if those that water ice on Mars today were on Earth, it'd be infected. Yeah, I mean, exactly. This is the question uh, that probably Miguel you can um, answer. So, what are the temperature ranges that we observe um, on Mars, for example, and uh, do we observe or what kind of life forms we observe um, in the similar temperature ranges on Earth? Yeah, well, there's two there's two things here. Uh, first is like we can find uh, some kind of uh, biosignatures based on, on what we have uh, studied before that are part of or were part of different microbes. We can find DNA, we can find RNA, we can find these kind of things. So finding a signature of something that has been there, it's let's say pretty easy. Not pretty easy, but it's not that that difficult to find it in different places in different environments. Polar environments are one uh, are one example of that. I mean, you can even find part of or you can detect uh, that a microbe is there or was there before um, pretty easily. It's it's really difficult. Something that that sometimes shocked people when when it hears it is like it's more difficult. At least in my opinion, I, I think that Catherine can 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 give us uh, her opinion as well. Uh, it's more difficult to find a place where you cannot find anything li alive than finding a place where you cannot find where you can find anything. I mean, everywhere you can find some some microbes. Everywhere you can find some part of different cells. So finding a, a signature is pretty easy. So I'm pretty sure that we are uh, going to find something interesting on Mars if we are dedicated to that. If we are using Alf the project Alf. Probably we are finding something uh, somewhere in there. Um, not in the near future, maybe, but let's say in, in not a, in not that many years. So the other thing is that can microbes be active at these places? And the answer is sometimes they can, at least on Earth. But this is what what Stephen has just said. Uh, the temperatures in here are not that extreme as on Mars, but uh, the microbes in here have evolved to be active in those temperatures. Why not if the the same microbes or the same original uh, life forms uh, were uh, set alone on Mars, why they cannot like try to evolve to be adapted to that? We can uh, we we are always finding new new thresholds for life uh, in bo on both extremes about temperature 
lower temperature, lowest, the lowest temperature every some time, every some years or every from a while, you can say, uh, well, there's a, these microbes can survive this low temperature and it's getting lower and lower. And same on the other side, this temperature, these microbes can, can survive this high temperature and it's getting higher and higher. So I think it's a matter of time just to try to find where the, the limits are. We are just pushing the limits every every other year with this study. So yeah, probably we'll find something. Yeah, there are two things about life in the cold temperatures. One is surviving cold temperatures and one, one is having metabolism in those cold temperatures. It has been found that no matter how low you go in temperatures, you can go close to absolute zero. Cells, when they froze, uh, they can survive any temperatures as low as you go. Uh, second thing is for metabolism, you need to uh, exchange material. So like get some material in and uh, excrete something. Uh, you can do that only in liquid media. And even in ice, even if you go to very cold temperatures down to minus 60 degrees Celsius, you still have on boundary layers between crystals, you have a, a very thin uh, layers of waters, water which can actually diffund uh, nutrients towards cells very slowly, but you still have, uh, even in the glaciers, which are super cold, you have thin layers of water, which can support metabolism very slow. The generation time will be maybe once per 1000 years uh, doubling, but it's, uh, it's possible. So life finds, we know from experimental results and from physics of the ice that life can, actually be there. I want to add that, I want to add, sorry, just one thing, that one of the projects that we have been carrying out in Antarctica these these past months and before in the Arctic, it's about that, trying to find active microbes on in the eyes of the glacier. So stay tuned. We are trying to find something interesting there. Well, let me make one comment to you, Jitender. Your, Your viewers are going to hear a lot about water or to be more precise, liquid water. And uh, there is something which the uh, technical people call the triple point, which has to do with atmospheric pressure. So not only is Mars cold, but it also has a very thin atmosphere. And so as you may know, if you move from say Gainesville, Florida, up to Denver, water will boil at a lower temperature because the pressure in Denver is lower than on Earth. And of course you go to the top of Mount Everest water will boil at a still lower pressure. So Mars, there's a, what's called the triple point of water is a pressure of the atmosphere that is so low that water can no longer exist at a liquid state at any temperature. And so what's very nice about Mars is that the actual planetary atmospheric pressure at, shall we call it, sea level is a little bit above the triple point of water. And of course, in canyons and valleys on Mars, the pressure is higher. <laughs> so it is possible for liquid water to exist on the surface of Mars, barely. And so your point is that you, and then of course in the summertime in Mars, especially at mid latitudes uh, or at low latitudes, you do have temperatures that are capable of melting water, ice, and creating uh, some amounts of liquid water. So it's, and of course, then there's a whole question about whether you could have local geothermal energy that would do the same. But all of this conversation centers on when you can get liquid water transiently, because as everybody, as Miguel just mentioned, Jan just mentioned, life can then do things. And then of course it freezes and then it can go into stasis for an indefinite period of time until the next opportunity comes for liquid water to be present. Exciting. And the um, and Catherine, so what are the examples that you observe um, in these kind of cold uh, temperatures? The, the examples of microbes, um, are they mainly bacteria, archaea? Do, do we care about these uh, uh, microbes or it can be any microbe, for example? So I think for our purposes, for life detection, we, we don't care. <laughs> We're not really interested in, in what uh, what specifically might be there, but in general, in the environments that I've looked at, at least, which is primarily uh, in terms of the cold environments that I've looked at, um, it's a lot of bacteria. And so that would be in places like uh, sea ice in the high Arctic or cryokinites or um, uh, active layer permafrost uh, and um, 
subsaline spring sediment. So lots of bacteria, still some archaea, and smaller amounts of eukaryotes in the form of some uh, extremophilic fungi, um, fungi that can tolerate um, uh, lower temperatures. Um, so just to explain, uh, cryokinites would be, um, so you have, if you have like sea ice or glaciers, you might see little pockets of uh, fluid filled depressions um, that collect sediment and uh, little pieces of particulate matter. And that makes a nice little hospitable home for microbes. So they're a nice little uh, refuge from the extreme conditions uh, surrounding, uh, surrounding the, the cryokinite holes. Um, and so these bacteria are primarily surviving by lowering, by taking incompatible solutes um, to keep their freezing points lower. So that way they don't just freeze and, and die. And so a compatible solute would be something, uh, a salty substance that lowers the freezing point of water in their cells, um, but that doesn't kill them based up because salt, taking in too much salt would just uh, be toxic to them. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's an example of what we might find. Yeah, so I think it seems like the mainly we care about, um, of course, the or the biosignatures that we have is mainly at the chemical level. Uh, so do we care about or what do we find, for example, in uh, the meteorites that we, uh, we get from Mars, you know, because that's, I think, uh, other exciting points. So what sort of chemistry we, we get out of those? Uh, what do we understand more about uh, life of Mars? Because I think that's directly a kind of souvenir for us, which arrives here on the, on the planet. And uh, we can kind of study and uh, understand more about uh, Mars geochemistry, geo geology, right? Right. I think now it's time to bring out the Black Beauty meteorite, <laughs> uh, which I just took from Stephen's collection. Uh, we have uh, meteorites coming to Earth from Mars, uh, which we can study here on Earth. As you know, uh, Perseverance rover is now collecting uh, mineral samples, which in the 30s they plan to send back and study. But nature is doing this sampler return for us. And Earth has been bombarded by Martian meteorites. That's when you have impact on Mars, which ejects uh, Martian rocks, and some of them make it all the way to Earth. So we have actually Martian rocks. You can touch them. <laughs> you can you can study them here on Earth. And we know uh, not from the surfaces that we touched, but from the inside of the meteorite that there's organic material which is in contrast to what we learned from Viking mission, uh, which uh, made a conclusion that there is no evidence of uh, organics in, a, in Venus, uh, in Mars, sorry, in Mars meteorites. Uh, I'm bringing up the Viking mission uh, because the information that there are no organics in, a, in Martian, uh, on Martian surface was the reason why we are not looking for life on Mars right now. I think Stephen can do much better job describing what I just said, but I don't want to let just Stephen talk about it. So. <laughs> but if, if you well, want yeah, to, I mean, really you got to keep in mind that is that the, the culture is important in science. 1976, a man named Gil Levin did an experiment where he thought he saw the release of carbon dioxide from the surface of Mars after you fed the surface of Mars some radioactively labeled food. So that's, of course, very analogous. If I give you, Jitender, some radioactively labeled food, you will exhale radioactively labeled carbon dioxide, and that's a signature of metabolism. Sadly, it's not a signature of evolution. But uh, then there was a result that was obtained by uh, something, an instrument called a gas chromatography mass spectrometer. It's not important that you understand what that machine is or does, but the claim was based on results from that machine that the Martian soil contained no organic molecules at all. And so it turned out that that was a statement that was stronger than the Gil Levin's experimental results showing metabolism, perhaps, and so the community concluded that there were no organics on Mars, therefore there was no life. 
Now, 20 years later, a man named Kevin Devine, who's now in London, came to my laboratory and we built some devices and did some experiments that showed that the um, experiment that concluded no organics on Mars was incorrectly done and the data were incorrectly interpreted. So by the year 20, 2000, we now knew that the experiment that was used by Viking 25 years earlier to disprove the presence of organics and therefore the presence of life on Mars was incorrectly interpreted. But that's 23 years ago, it's another quarter century has passed, but Vicki Meadows and Heather Graham had a committee for, uh, endorsed by NASA to do life detection. And if you read their report, they still do not know, but they still conclude that there are no organics on the surface of Mars and that rules out life on the surface of Mars and that the idiots who ran the experiments in 1976, right, uh, should not even have bothered to do the experiment. So this is, of course, is a real problem culturally because people have found all kinds of organics on Mars, all right? I mean, the rovers have found organics on Mars. We, Kevin Devine and I predicted certain classes of organics on Mars. But so, so Everett Gibson, who was a man studying meteorites from Mars, was looking at a meteorite called Nakla, which is a meteorite that landed in Egypt. Oh, it's been 50 years. And so he was looking deep inside. This is not one of those basalts that John just showed you. This is actually a rock that is more, quote, sedimentary in, in nature than that igneous rock that Jan shows you. And he, as he was about to retire, he cornered me at a conference and handed me a rock. And he said, look, Stephen, we have found in this meteorite carbon, associated with nitrogen in a region deep inside the meteorite and decide what to do with it. I'm retired. <laughs> and, and so and the problem that you have with all of these meteorites, especially uh, Nakla, is that they could be, well, they were on Earth a while before someone walked over and picked them up. And so it's possible that Earth organics could have contaminated the meteorite. And that was a big problem with the Allen Hills meteorite. They eventually did find organics in it, but eventually they were able to show those organics came from Earth, not from the meteorite itself. So, so your problem is, yes, we've got all kinds of cultural problems that stand in the way of searching for extant life on Mars. And a lot of it goes back to a fundamental misinterpreted experiment from 1976, which has persisted now for nearly a half a century, even though again and again and again, uh, people have shown that there's plenty of organics on the surface of Mars. And I mean, I find if Jitender, if you're interested and your audience certainly is interested, is in the process of science. We teach in eighth grade middle school science fairs, right? That a single data that contradicts your theory causes your theory to be re-examined. No, <laughs> that's not the way science works. We have had now for a half a century the conclusion by the culture in the community, which is, and remember, culture is what you think when you're not thinking, okay? It's just sort of what you automatically think. We've had a half a century of culture convinced that the Viking experiment showed no organics and therefore no life on the surface of Mars when they showed nothing of the kind. And so what NASA does, or it's not NASA, NASA does not fly missions exactly, right? What NASA does is makes decisions about what missions to fly based on community peer review of proposals are competing. And the community has is now spending a lot of money to fly drones on Mars. We roll things around looking for rocks on Mars. Right now, we are picking rocks up and bringing them back to a cache to return to Mars. But the NASA, basically, the community will not go search for extant life on Mars because the culture has been so warped, it is impossible to change no matter how much data you present to it. That's a comment about how science is done. I'd love to add on to that as well. Um, it, it, that's such an interesting point about uh, the culture of science. And I know that's something you've written about in your in your blog, Steve, Stephen, um, longtime reader of Primordial Scoop over here. Um, <laughs> uh, but I was actually at the uh, at that workshop. I think that's the first time I met you, Jan. Um, so it was great to make the connection with somebody who uh, really believes that life detection should be done, you know, urgently, and I definitely share that view. Um, the Viking results were 100% misinterpreted, and it's such a shame that that has 
persisted and continued. Um, my takeaway from that portion of the workshop, at least, uh, it reminded me a lot of something that Patricia Stratt, who was a, a co-investigator on the, um, the label release experiment, uh, along with Gil Levin, um, and I had the pleasure of corresponding with her, never, never talked to Gil Levin, I would have loved that though. Um, but she wrote in her book about after the labeled release experiment results came back, she was talking with someone at NASA, some administrator or something, and you know the results were exciting and controversial at the time as well. Um, but obviously because they were contradicting with that that GCMS, you know, no organics here. At least that was the view. Um, she said, you know, our results are obviously kind of uh, maybe leading us a different way. Why does it have to be a yes or no? Why does it have to be yes, there's life? No, there's not life. Why is there no room for maybe? And the person told her that there was no room for maybe. Um, and something that I think that I hope is changing and that I got the sense that was changing at that workshop was that we're making room for maybe. We're making room for a maybe in the in the in life detection studies. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, a definitive yes or no. And part of the, I, I, I think part of the misinterpretation of the Viking results, particularly the label release Viking results, is that, you know, they they clashed with the the prevailing view of the GCMS at the time, but they had so many interesting uh, ways to interpret them positively. Um, so like Stephen said, you know, we eat uh, radioactive carbon, we'll exhale radioactive carbon dioxide. Um, so they they did observe that you know that uh, so-called exhalation of radioactive carbon dioxide, but what they also saw was that when they took their soil sample from Mars in the label release experiment, the that positive uh, exhalation of carbon dioxide was inactivated when the soil sample was heated up, and it was partially inactivated when the soil sample was partially heated, which is exactly what would happen with uh, a soil sample from Earth that had bacteria in it. If you if you bake it, the bacteria are going to die, and they're not going to be able to exhale. And if you partially bake it, some of them will die, and some of them will not be able to exhale. Um, there was also inactivation observed when the samples were stored uh, long term in in the dark, and that would that is also something consistent with terrestrial biology. Um, so yeah, there's just there's so many things about the labeled release experiment and the Viking biology experiments that that warrant uh, a second, a third, a fourth look, and uh, just to to work out these misinterpretations and yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's something, yeah. And I, regarding the yes and no answer, I would say that getting no answer, there is no life, is much harder logically. Uh, True, for sure. Because, because if you don't detect life with your experiment, it might mean that there's no life just in the site which you sampled. But life yeah. can be just around the corner, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't. I think it was something you guys wrote in the original Alf paper um, that, like, a, a absence of evidence in one spot is not absence of evidence. Period. So, yeah. like especially many, when many, you're looking at such tiny, tiny yeah. areas. Many, many people are repeating this sentence, but I think it needs to be repeated more and more. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I understand all of your excitement, but then what do you think about the argument about uh, like contamination, for example? The, because I think this sample was analyzed on Mars, right? The, we, we, we have never received a sample from Mars on Earth to analyze it. So since it was, um, so or what are the steps taken to avoid contamination once we are um, org organizing these kind of missions? Yeah, that's a question for Catherine and Miguel because yep. they are built. Yep. Uh, astrobiologists. Yeah. So something interesting about the uh, that we were talking about uh, that we were just talking about the the culture of science as well. Um, the uh, the standards for uh, decontaminating a spacecraft that that we take to Mars uh, so that we don't contaminate Mars with any terrestrial microbes. Those standards haven't really changed since uh, since the Viking mission as well. So since 1976, um, and that's something that uh, you know. The, the culture can evolve. And if we have more missions, that would be really, really interesting to uh, to see evolve as well. I think it's something like, it also depends on the area on Mars on to which you're going. If you're going to somewhere, I think there are five categories, I believe. So category five would be an area that you are, that we think is most likely to either harbor life or 
let terrestrial life uh, survive and propagate, that would have the most stringent uh, sterilization uh, requirements. I think it's something like, Miguel, please correct me if I'm wrong, um, like 300 bacterial spores per meter or something like that on uh, on the spacecraft. Don't quote me. <laughs> um, and a category one would be an area that you are uh, least likely to, uh, to find life. Um, something really interesting about ALF, uh, I think, is that it doesn't necessarily rely, the, the concept of a mission doesn't necessarily rely on going to an area that would be considered category five. So an area where uh, terrestrial life would be very likely to survive and propagate. Um, the idea of ALF, and obviously Jan and Steven, please correct me if I'm uh, miswording this, but the idea is that instead of going to an area where there would be a high concentration of, uh, of microbes, you could go to an area like mid-latitude uh, ice sheets where you are able to concentrate life that has been dispersed by a dust storm and collected on the ice sheets and then concentrate that sparse life. Um, so you're kind of avoiding that pan of worms of, of category five special regions altogether. Yep. Um, yeah, exactly. We we plan to add ALF, which is the Agnostic Life Finder uh, instrument to missions that are going to mine the Martian water, water ice, regardless whether they are going to be astrobiological missions or not. So as a uh, Humanity plans to go to Mars. Um, NASA officially with program Artemis, Elon Musk with SpaceX, and of course Chinese uh, space engine agency all uh, are officially saying that they are going to Mars. And if you send humans to Mars, you have to be ready to provide for them local resources, which is harvesting carbon dioxide to make oxygen out of it, but also uh, harvesting the local ice. So before we send the humans and we are going to send humans, we need to mine Martian ice. And once you mine large quantities of Martian ice, you can extract the genetic polymers, uh, which are polyelectrolytes using our instrument. And that's how you can find life on Mars uh, while you are preparing to send humans there. So it has to be before we send humans there. So that's the crucial idea behind Al. But there will be many tons of water harvested uh, on, on, on Mars, right? Yeah, it's going to be tons and tons. So the ALF is inspired by, by instruments used in the industry, which are made to, uh, they are like in principle, big desal desalinators or in a food and beverage industry, you will use uh, Elect, uh, it's called membrane electrodialysis, uh, where you have membranes and you pass through membranes in electric field molecules, which are charged. And so you are selecting by charge and size. And we, we will be selecting molecules that are not too small, which would be inorganic ions, and not too large, which would be like charged mineral particles. We are looking, we are concentrating just molecules that are polyelectrolytes and our size uh, like biomolecules. Uh, so this instrument we are making, ALF, is inspired by industrial uh, electrodialysis, which is used, for example, for beverage preparation when you make, uh, uh, when you remove acids from cranberry juice or where you uh, demineralize milk, you use the same principle. So we know that it can be used for tons and tons of highly concentrated organics. Uh, the membranes can are now developed to work for, for years. So that's, that's our idea, that we would take the all of the water that is going to be extracted on Mars and all of it will be the astrobiological sample. So yeah, we will concentrate not from one milliliter as it's normally done with uh, astrobiological emissions, but from hundreds of tons of uh, ice. And that's, that's the beauty of ALF. This is also the advantage from synthetic biology. If we did not have a lot of synthetic biology looking for alternative informational polymers, and of course information is one of the key components of Darwinian evolution, we would not know that a repeating charge is a universal characteristic of 
Darwinian informational polymers. But once you know that, right, if I have a molecule that's going to either be, let's just say as a repeating negative charge, we know that if we put that in an electric field, it will move towards the positively charged electrode. Or if this Martian life is really quite alien and it uses a informational polymer with a repeating positive charge, well, then that molecule will move towards a negatively charged electrode in an electric field. So you're in the situation now where if I can get a, a, a you know cubic meter of, of ice and say there are 10 bacterial cells in that, a very sparse life indeed. But if I'm going to be um, mining uh, thousands of those cubic meters of ice, I'm, and then if I can put the, those that material into an electric field so as to move the informational polymers with a repeating charge out of the bulk flow and into a concentrate, I have a much better chance of doing the detection of even very sparse life. And so combining SpaceX, mining large amounts of water so as to prepare propellant, for example, to bring the astronauts home when they eventually arrive, I can sit astride that mining operation with a relatively low cost electrodialysis device and concentrate sparse lice from it in the process of doing what they're gonna be doing anyhow, which is mining, melting, and then processing large amounts of water from the near surface of Mars. I'd like to say, to jump in a, a bit, sorry, um, because also I have to leave in 10 minutes, so sorry about that. Um, um, what I wanted to say is that well, there's a lot of topics that came came in into into the discussion. Um, all of them are are just saying that Alf is the is one of the of the answers of what we are trying what we are trying to to um, to use to detect life on Mars. So first of all, is that I think that the audience will probably they will know, but it's worth it. It's worth to 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 know that. Uh, being organic in terms of being a molecule that it's organic is not the same as having a biotic origin. So this is one of the problems that we have right now in, uh, with the detections of organics on Mars. So it's difficult to say if they came from any li living form or not with the, with the instruments that we have so far in the, uh, on Mars. And that's something that Alpha will, will solve. Uh, the, the, the prototype or the, or the technique that is going to be used with it. Um, the thing is that they are finding uh, small molecules, small organic mo molecules. Uh, so it's difficult to say, as I said before, it's difficult to say if they have a biotic origin or not. But as alpha or alpha is, is finding these, these bigger molecules that are really difficult to be formed in the absence of life, um, the thing is that we are going to be more sure that the origin of that is a biotic origin. I mean, it's from a living organism. So that's that's one of the good things about this. And the other thing is about the contamination, potential contamination coming from Earth. Uh, we published a paper uh, some years ago talking about the difficulties of finding uh, something that is not contaminated in the Atacama Desert, which is one of the most famous and better best analogs of, of the Martian surface we have here on Earth. And we showed that um, there's microbes coming from the sea to very long distances into the desert and we still can find them in there. So um, having humans as a potential contaminator of the humans of the sorry of the Martian surface, it's going to be a huge problem because even if they are just landing on some of the on some let's say small area on Mars, it's very difficult not to send with wind or whatever send some microbes that they are carrying into different areas. Probably one of the areas that Catherine mentioned, one of the the ones that are going to be. Uh, more interesting or more prone to to have life on them, so we have to bear that in mind as well. And talking about the the thing uh, that we 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 also discussed, Catherine also discussed about the how to clean the instrument that we are find, we are going to to send them to send there. Um, I haven't done that myself, but I have colleagues that have been working on that, and it's probably one of the most difficult things just to do the planetary protection, which is called. Maybe you remember this guy. This this. Uh, this kid that sent a, a letter to NASA saying, hey, I want to be a planetary protector. And it's not like that. I mean, what when we mean planetary protection is just protecting the planet that we are going to, not things that are coming to our planet. So doing this is probably even more difficult than 
being part of uh, being one of the Avengers just to protect our our <laughs> our planet. So that's something that the audience also has to bear in mind. I'd love to yeah. just uh, uh, correct something that I said earlier um, regarding the uh, the categories uh, for missions. Um, so category five actually refers to uh, sample return missions. It's a, a type of category four that is the uh, special regions on Mars that um, that are those areas likely to uh, to harbor or uh, enable propagation of terrestrial life. And those regions have to be sterilized to a level of 30 spores total per spacecraft. It's uh, it's the landers that have to have 300 spores per, per square meter. I just don't want to give anyone the wrong uh, the wrong information. Yeah, and I would like to say regarding the contamination, uh, I think Alf elegantly solves the problem about contamination by examining such a large sample. So nobody expect that a whole starship will be clean to uh, 30 spores per one square meter or what's the limit. But the point is, if we are going to mine tons of local ice, and so in the first, in the beginning, we will be detecting a lot of those contaminations we brought with us. But as you are pumping more and more of the Martian water through the system, the first signals uh, of the life we brought uh, will be declining um, exponentially as you go further. So after a couple months of continuous looking for life, we will stop finding life we brought with us and we get to the baseline of the life, which is actually the indigenous one. So again, because we are sampling such a large, large sample from, from underground, um, we are unlikely, or we can use this technique how to avoid the contamination. Interesting. And uh, so one question that I have uh, is the, the this conceptual question. So I don't know if you guys are aware of assembly theory by Lee Cronin and Sarah Walker. So how how is that uh, kind of um, related to ALF and what you are trying to do? I think Stephen so, can so. talk about it. He wrote sure. a recent blog post and he has a back and forth with Lee Cronin. About <laughs> what that. are your views on this, uh, Stephen? Well, I, I look. I mean, I, I like Lee, and I like the concept of assembly theory. I think there is no question that a collection. This is the, the same problem that Miguel just mentioned, right? You've got an organic molecule there. Now, at some level, you got to decide: did that molecule get there by a process of Darwinian evolution, or did it get there by a non-biological process? So, one of the nice things about having a repeating polyelectrolyte with size and shape regular building blocks is that that's the kind of molecule that you can't get easily without Darwinian evolution to create it and to maintain it. So that's great. Um, the Lee's, of course, going at the products of Darwinian evolution. He is saying not, not the molecules that are necessary to do Darwinian evolution, but what is the outcome of a living system. And it's an interesting com concept, right? You can go to Mars, scoop up some stuff, and do an inventory of all the organic molecules that are in that sample. All right. Now, then what you can say is, great. One of your problems is, of course, sensitivity, right? If I don't have more than two or three copies of a molecule in the sample, I'm not going to see it. But the idea would be that if I can do an inventory and I can see molecules, say a million copies of a molecule, then I'm going to say, okay, A, that's a product of non-Darwinian evolution that is not a product of non-life, or B, it's a product of life. And what Lee is suggesting is that you can distinguish between those two hypotheses by asking the structural complexity of that molecule that you've gotten in large amounts. Now, um, of course, you have to worry a little bit about whether that's a complex molecule that is thermodynamically favored, right? It would be made in large amounts because it's just a very stable molecule. But if you decide that it's not that, right, if the molecule has a certain level of complexity, which you can analyze, say, by mass spectrometry, then you can say that's the process, that, that's a molecule that could not have come from any system other than one that had access 
the Darwinian evolution. And, you know, I mean, my view of that is that that's a really an indisputably positive idea. And the only question is now implementing it, especially if that life that you're looking for that's making that molecule is sparse. And therefore, you have to worry about finding that in a large sample. But don't you think that you will need also a database for ALF, for example, uh, just to cat categorize the, the kind of... Uh, uh, poly electrolytes uh, that we find here on Earth, and uh, maybe something that that would be an alien. Um, well, it's, or, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, sure. I mean, the, the concept of database. Remember, this is not coming. Uh, the concept that life, the, the informational molecules required universally for Darwinian evolution must be poly electrolytes, is not coming from an examination of life on Earth. Right? It's coming from laboratory experiments which try to make molecules that can do Darwinian evolution independent of what we have on Earth. Now, Carol Cleland on primordialscoop.org, Catherine has mentioned the blog, Carol Cleland insists that we are so narrow in our chemistry that we are so constrained by what we see on the, in the biosphere around us that we are incapable of being sufficiently imaginative, imaginative to step far outside. Now, of course, she and I have a disagreement on that. But the argument is that once you've got the, the statement that you are talking about, not specific molecules, or even 100 different classes of our alternative informational molecules we've made in the laboratory, but general chemical features, I don't have to have a database. I just say, ha, huh, I have just concentrated a polyelectrolyte from 1,000 you know, metric tons of water. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at that poly electrolyte and see if it's built from size and shape regular building blocks. And if it is, it's not, I mean, <clears throat> yep. whether it's in my database or not, it's not important. I can recognize size and shape regular molecular structures because I know about chemistry in general, not because I have made a collection of specific molecules that are size and shape regular. So I, I, I'm perfectly capable of discovering a new genetic biopolymer by concentrating based on the universal feature of repeating charge and then analyzing based on general universal chemistry and I'll come up with a new molecule. I can recognize that as meeting what Jan mentioned is the Schrodinger size shape regular feature as well as polyelectrolyte and know whether that's a molecule capable of supporting Darwinian evolution or not without having ever seen this molecule before. It's unlikely to be false positive, extremely unlikely. Something to add on to that as well, um, Stephen, you mentioned uh, concentrating. And I think that that's the key, to me, that's one of the really key brilliant things about ALF is that it's, ALF is the ability by which you um, uh, concentrate your, your biosignatures, your potential biomolecules, these polyelectrolytes that would be a, a universal sign of, of life. Um, and then downstream from ALF is where you would have the method by which you would determine exactly what that polyelectrolyte is, if it's size shape, uh, if it if it follows the if it has these uh, uh, an aperiodic crystal structure, um, if it looks if it has a you know long repeating backbone, um, and you would do that with mass spectroscopy, something like nanocore sequencing, and at that point I think a, a database of maybe common clean room contaminants, common uh, extremophile microorganisms in similar terrestrial analog environments could be useful as a comparison, um, both to get a baseline of maybe what you have and, you know, in the very unlikely scenario where it is contamination, because, you know, if you have E. coli pulled out of ALF, maybe you would be able to say that's that's contamination. And uh, you can compare that with your, uh, your, your database of um, nanopore uh, sequences. Yeah, that's brilliant, Catherine. Yeah, I mean, we do need databases, but the databases is to try to manage earth contamination. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, I mean, I have one quick question to Miguel because he has to leave. Um, so, so I uh, had a couple of conversations with Nick Lane, and he um, he made an interesting point that uh, so so all the microorganisms they live off of their wastes. 
like on on uh, you know so somehow they kind of uh, live together in a way right and that's why we have so many difficulties to cultivate these microorganisms in the lab right uh, so what do you expect uh, expect in 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 the case of mars for example so because then we are not looking for uh, we should be looking for like many many microbes if there are mi microbes but then the the question also comes if there are so many species there uh, what kind of uh, contributions we see in terms of biosignatures like i mean there are time to time examples of methane and uh, etc of different gases um so what are your comments on that um yeah well um yeah that's that's true that's true um having only one microbe like living alone it's it's uh, really difficult without uh, the specific features that they need to to solve the specific problem that they need to solve to to be part of the environment or whatever you want to say um fortunately we have discovered this this new well it's been a long time since they were discovered and they are everyday everyday work today the um techniques that are independent culture independent so it's not that difficult just to culture them just to describe them we can just go into any of these other technique techniques as as Catherine is one of uh of the biggest experts in the world in mean ion so that's something that that she can she can elaborate on and how easy is just to try to to describe them well easy let's say that uh to describe the microbes with that you can find in in some specific uh, sample but uh yeah well i would say that that it's not going to be easy just to find um one single cell or to describe one single cell as a whole but we can also find different parts of this uh, the dna the body electrolytes that we are all, always talking during this this discussion that's not going to be difficult to to find to find as a, as a first step i mean just to recognize what, what are we looking for and then say hey we found it great and then let's try to describe it uh, in different in different ways and talking about the metabolisms that they can be carrying out uh at these places as well we tend to think about what life is here on earth and many people just think so okay we need some sugars then we need some water and that's everything we need to survive but the thing is that we are discovering and we have discovered before uh, a lot of different organisms that can be living that can metabolize different things, different uh, even heavy metals or, or as you say, methane and this kind of thing. So probably it's difficult just to say what are we expecting to find on on Mars because as on Earth there are a lot of different environments on Mars. On Mars, so um, let's say that microbes can probably be adapted to that. This takes us. This leads us to to the first the first topic of the of the biology part of this discussion is Darwinian evolution. So if there's something that can give an electron and there's something that can accept an electron and that creates a current, let's say, uh, some kind of differential uh, on the reduction power and that can be um, used to, to generate uh, energy for a cell, then why not are we going to find that on, on the environment that we're trying to, to describe? So be confident on that. <laughs> I mean, we are probably finding something there and and, it's going to be shocking for us as well, for sure. But it's not impossible to find something there. That's that's uh, well, that, what I would like to say before leaving. Um, I'm so sorry that I have to leave. I have another appointment right now. Uh, but that's the thing that the, the take home message. Be confident on, on this kind of projects. We are going to find something interesting and we are going to describe that probably in the near future. And sorry, I, I have to go, as I said. And sure, sure. I want yeah. to, to thank you for having me here. And I also want to thank the audience to for having uh, this time with us and and hope we can meet in the future with some good results. Uh, thank you for yeah. joining us, Miguel. See you. Thank you, Miguel. My, my pleasure, my Bye, pleasure. Miguel. See you. Bye. Okay, so then let's continue with uh, Catherine. So Catherine, what do you think about um, uh, about the same aspect that why we don't see or do we see some biosignatures when it comes to, at least at the planet level, when it comes to uh, proposing that there are micro there is microbial life on on mars um you know it's a it's a tough thing it also really depends on what you define as as a biosignature um and what you would define as as life um 
I think everyone in this group might have the same definition for life and the same definition for biosignature. But if you were to ask your your neighbor or your mom or your friend, what do they think life is? You would probably get three different <laughs> answers. You know, life is something that can grow and reproduce. Life is something that has uh, DNA. Life is something that can undergo, um, uh, that can respond to changes in its environment, respond to stimulus. A really common definition of life for astrobiologists, at least, is that it's under it's capable of undergoing it's a self sustaining system capable of undergoing Darwinian evolution, and so that really is what uh, I think drives a lot of life detection studies and a lot of biosignature studies. So, in terms of a of a global biosignature like methane, it could be you know, something produced abiotically, it could be a sign of, um, it could also be a sign of biotic production of methane through um, microbial methanogenic metabolism. Um, but that's not necessarily, if, if you're going by the the operational definition of life as a self-sustaining system capable of undergoing Darwinian evolution, the production of methane is difficult to fit into that. And so by looking for something that enables Darwinian evolution, like a polyelectrolyte, rather than something that is produced by Darwinian evolution, you get a little bit more um, assurance that what you're seeing is uh, a definitive biosignature rather than, you know, maybe a more um, uh, ambiguous biosignature. Interesting. Yeah. And the other question that we have in the chat is the, so it just extends the idea of panspermia. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what if life came from somewhere else on Mars, mm -hmm. you know? So it's like uh, this infinite uh, regress. Yeah. So uh, what are your comments on that? Ultimately, it's not going to be infinite, infinite because universe is finite, right? In time. Uh, yeah, panspermia is definitely possible, at least within our solar system. As I said, we have uh, samples from, from Mars, and we are pretty sure that during large impacts, uh, like the one that killed uh, dinosaurs 60 million years ago, uh, you have ejections of material which gets all the way to Mars. And of course, in the early solar system, such exchanges were more common than they are now. So very likely, regardless where the life originated, it was likely distributed throughout our solar system. So for this reason, likely uh, there's going to be just one life system, but using, for example, DNA as we have on Earth, but it's still possible that the DNA is going to be slightly different. Uh, that's why we need to search for like- universal. I think something else, yeah, I think yep. something else uh, to add on to that, if, if life originated somewhere else and then jumped to Mars and then jumped to Earth, um, you know, the, the meteoritic exchange between Earth and Mars, the, or the heaviest point of meteoritic exchange between Earth and Mars was some 4 billion years ago. So if life was seeded between our two planets at that point, it has had 4 billion years to diverge from each other. So any oh. Martian life that shared a, a, a common ancestor with Earth, it would map so far outside of the, the tree of life. I, I don't know how to, you would um, trace its like definitive origin when it when it has diverged so far back in in time. Um, so if it came from even further out, I don't I don't know how that would be how, how where you would determine that point of origin or or how to do that. But it's certainly an interesting uh, interesting thing to think about. And yeah, you just have to consider that divergence happening on on geological time scales. Yeah, it's possible that the intercourse between Mars and Earth that would have transferred it was done before the ribosome was even invented, before protein translation was invented. So with the way we normally trace um, phylogeny on Earth is by looking at the most conserved biopolymer sequences, and those are very often from the ribosome and protein translation machinery. Um, there are other characters that you can use to try to determine phylogeny other than, for example, um, just sequence data. So, for example, the use of nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide for oxidation reduction reactions or the use of flavin adenine dinucleotide 
these are characteristics that are presumably emerging during the RNA world episode of life on Earth. And so one could try to come up with markers of this kind, but they're not going to give you anything close to a clock. Interesting. And the so, but what do you think about, for example, um, let's say that if we if we think that uh, life did originate, I mean, um, on Mars, but like when it comes to Earth or, or the origin of life on Earth, um, the contribution of Moon is also now considered an important event. So, uh, what are your views on this? Uh, does Mars has a Moon? I'm, I'm not sure. Mars has two moons, but they are, well, as you know, Mars is the god of war, so the Martian moons are fear and terror, Deimos and Phobos, but they are very, very small, and they are captured, presumably, asteroids. So, yeah, I mean, the, the role of the moon on Earth is uh, is not, well, there's a lot, there are books written on this subject, right? So one possibility is it may stabilize the Earth's um, um physics right so the earth pretty much well mars every now and then undergoes a uh, coupling between its angular momentum and the movement of jupiter and various other things so the poles change and it flips and does all sorts of things and the moon prevents the earth from doing that now it's not clear i mean jan might tell you that the flipping of the martian poles and the axis of orientation is important to sustain life um we don't really know what happens if well jan take that one away <laughs> okay yeah that's uh that's the changes in obliquity in a in a martian uh rotational axis tilt right right now mars is about 25 degrees which is about this much which is about as much uh, difference between the summer and winter insulation as we have on earth right that's uh so during the if you are if you are on mars in here right this is sun then you are in the summer in here Right, that uh, Mars goes around the sun, and then um, of course this spot is uh, now in, on the winter side, right? So, but if you have a higher obliquity, which means higher tilt of the axis, then the sun is shining directly towards the pole. So the uh, polar uh, ice cap is being uh, dissolved and sublimated a lot more, and you have Mars, which is actually a lot. Uh, lot warmer. Um, well, it has thicker atmosphere, which is increasing our overall temperature and the pressure uh, because of the sublimation of the polar ice caps, which are both water and carbon dioxide. So during the high obliquity periods, which happening on a, a like 100,000 year scale, you have much warmer, much uh, more humid Mars with a large percentage of the surface being actually above the triple point. And during those high obliquity periods, um, the mid-latitude glaciers are actually growing. So they are growing towards the um, towards the equator. Uh, that's because as you have a, like the large tilt, uh, the uh, polar ice caps are being uh, dissolved and sublimated, but they snow, well, there's a snow precipitation on the other side because the winters are more cold. So uh, you are growing the uh, glacier on the other, other side. So during those periods, the, the glaciers we currently have, uh, I call them lasagna ice. Uh, those, those are the glaciers which are in those mid latitudes. And they are growing uh, during the periods when you have high humidity, higher higher temperatures. Basically, Mars is in those periods more uh, likely to sustain life. And during those periods, you are growing the ice that is going to be mined. So that's the idea. And the glaciers are growing only if uh, if uh, between the summer and winter. During, of course, if if it goes on the other side, the glacier from the mid latitudes would be evaporated uh, unless it is covered by a layer of dust. So we know that the mid latitude glaciers are growing as layers of water ice and dust, water ice and dust, which means that the dust comes from entire globe. Uh, those are the Martians global dust storms. So the glacier will actually contain samples from the entire surface. That's why by sampling just one side, 
in mid latitudes on Mars, you can sample entire Martian surface. And that's, that's the idea how we can find life on Mars without, without searching, actually going to every special region. If you make large enough sample of uh, mid latitude ice, you are certain to sample the entire Mars during its highest, uh, well, wettest and highest temperature uh, during time when it was most fertile. So, and one, one more point about this, uh, when we look in ice, in deep uh, ice on earth, uh, we can find life in there, even if it's the, all this ice we know, which is 8 million years old, we can find still some uh, DNA in there. We are not sure if the life in, in this ice is still uh, surviving, metabolizing, but we are certain that we can find DNA in 8 million year old ice which means that on Mars, those high obliquity periods are happening on much faster cycle than is the time life can survive in deep ice. So, or can be detected at least. So that's what, that's why I'm confident that we can find something. Yeah, and especially I think the, the all of you, like the your excitement, it's amazing, you know? So, <laughs> um, so with that, I mean, uh, what do you think? So what are you going to do more with Alpha Mars project? Uh, how people can contribute to to this work? Uh, because I mean, of course, science is a sh social phenomena and somehow that's why we are also doing this, right? So that we, we can uh, explain the progress of uh, the kind of work that we are doing to the people, but also kind of un other ways how people can be involved in in the, in the, the kind of work that you you guys are doing. Well, I think the important part is to spread the word that there is a chance to find life on Mars quite soon. Uh, finding alien life would be, all, of course, uh, like changing, like culture-defining discovery, right? There's not much, many more discoveries you can make uh, that would be like bigger discoveries these days. So... It's a very important discovery we should make. We can make it quite soon. And nobody is talking about it. Nobody is investing in it. Governments are currently do not care about this. Um, it's too bad that Miguel is already gone, but he co-authored paper, which points out that currently no instruments on Mars or instruments that are planned to be sent to Mars, uh, none of these could detect uh, life even in Atacama Desert. On Earth, so they are quite unlikely to find life on Mars. So currently, there are no plans to send missions to Mars that would be able to find life on Mars. But I believe we can do it, and we can do it quite cheaply as an add-on to missions that must be flown to Mars. So spread the word about this. That's one thing. Second thing, go to our website alphamars.org, which is spelled with F. That's Alien Life Finding Associations association mars so a l f a mars.org and uh, read more about us and you can decide to support us financially so i believe that over time nasa will change its uh, priorities and starts to decide that it's a good idea to look for life on mars before we send humans there but right now they are not supporting such research so I'm now relying mostly on Steven's support, uh, who's uh, reluctantly supporting me. I'm also <laughs> su supporting my, well, I contributed uh, myself to, so I can buy a new peristaltic pump and, and ask my parents to provide some financial, like, you know, support. So that's how we are surviving right now, but, we, we need more support because this is not sustainable for long. Steven, although he's uh, he's rich because of his uh, biotech companies, uh, he's um, also, I don't know, he does not, does not want to support me like solely, so. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, so you gotta keep in mind that uh, um, <coughs> Catherine Connolly and John Rummel, oh, I guess about five years ago, published a uh, paper where they concluded that uh, 
Um, uh, uh, there is, and I'm quoting now from, I actually opened the quote, there is no consensus within the Mars community for conducting missions that might detect extant life on Mars. Um, we had that, and that's a statement of culture, and that statement, that culture, as we've already discussed, is very much influenced by a misunderstanding of what happened in the, the last time that we looked for life on Mars. Um, and the, 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 the result is that NASA will spend money to fly drones, they'll collect rocks. In fact, that was the decision made in the decadal survey, oh, 20, oh, maybe 10 years ago, that the, we're spending all of our mon time and effort on Mars right now running around picking up rocks to be returned at some future date to look for past life. Now, you know, <laughs> part of the reason for this is institutional. Remember that NASA doesn't make decisions exactly. They go out to the community to do panels to make them choose missions. But NASA was experienced in 1976, the sociology where they had a program, lots of people were employed, everybody was busy. The GC mass spec result came in and within a matter of weeks, the Caltech operation at Jet Propulsion Laboratory that was running this shut down. Budgets were lost, jobs were lost, people went away, did other things. And this for a government agency in particular is just a disaster. Right. So NASA has become institutionally very, very conservative. They are not willing to ever send a mission to Mars any longer to look for extant life because they're afraid that the failure to find extant life will cause the public to lose interest in their programs. And that's the reason why now NASA, even when astrobiology. So, you know, in 1996, the Allen Hill meteorite came along and uh, there were cell-like structures in it. And Dan Golden, who was the head of NASA, um, uh, Bill Clinton, who was president at the time, went to Dan and said, is this life or not? And Golden says, I don't know. And Clinton effectively said, well, why are we paying you, right? NASA is the agency who's supposed to tell me when we get this kind of data, whether or not it's a sign of alien life or not. So that's actually how the NASA Astrobiology Institute got started, that they decided to spend 20 years looking for this. But they for the to do the basic science that would allow them to answer the question that Bill Clinton asked Dan Golden in 1996. But all of NASA missions were designed ever since not to look for extant life. You could look for habitability, you could look for water, you could follow the water, but you couldn't look for extant life because they were afraid that if the answer was no, the program would be forced to dissolve. And so <laughs> what this means, now in 2019, in Carlsbad, Mike Meyer, a great guy, he heads the Mars Exploration Program at NASA, convened in Carlsbad, North Carolina, uh, sorry, in Carlsbad, New Mexico, uh, a group to look for exit life as a report out of it. And uh, I thought, okay, finally, at long last, NASA is going to get over this Viking 1976 funk and actually go look for life. Well. COVID intervened and, and, and nothing ever came of it. So I think Jan's point, and I think it's quite correct, that is if there's going to be a life detection ever, in, at least certainly my lifetime, on Mars, um, one has to take advantage of two things. First is that Martian exploration has now been, if you'll pardon the phrase, democratized, right? There are people other than NASA who are thinking of going to Mars. Now, I'm not sure that Elon Musk is the ultimate Democrat, but the bottom line is that it's a second choice. And of course, China is a third choice. So there are other people going to Mars. But at this point, the way we're going to get extant life detection done, given the cultural problems that Catherine and, and, and I discussed a few moments ago, as well as the institutional problems that NASA is afraid to declare that it's looking for life, is if private people step up to the plate, make donations. I mean, the building of of the ALF life detector, the agnostic life finder is, is minuscule compared to the matter of the price of launching things, as you saw, saw at Boca Chico yesterday, it's a $3 billion launch. No, but no. The, what, okay, whatever it was. But the fact that let's, not, let's not discuss. I, I'm sorry I said it. I'm sorry. I really sorry I said it. But, but, but the fact that they're going to, there are other ways of getting agnostic life finding instruments to Mars then to persuade a NASA culture to send one. 
means that there's an opportunity now for private individuals through Jan's uh, Alpha to make contributions that are actually meaningful towards the discovery of extant life on Mars. Mm. Yeah, I, I want to like uh, extend what Stephen was saying. Actually, it's not billions of dollars now. It's uh, getting to millions and small interplanetary mission can cost as little as $10 million, which is for some individuals pocket change. So not for us, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, but it's, so it's collectively, the but collectively a, a, a reasonable number of small individuals for whom $100 or $200 is something that they can use to contribute to this mission actually mm -hmm. has a chance of having impact. Yeah. Like a lot of small donations end up, so you can just visit our website and send five bucks. You will know that you contributed to looking for life on Mars. Yeah, and also how many avenues it can open. I mean, like, first of all, just knowing that, okay, there is another uh, version of life somewhere else, another example of life, right? And yeah. hopefully that it'll be different than what we have here. I At least I hope that <laughs> as a biochemist, you know, like just to have another kind of version of it, just to expand our knowledge that, okay, even with different kind of biochemistry or I don't know, like the, the, the code, it's possible to do it. So that will be exciting. But also I think the, um, I, I don't know, like the space travel, et cetera, um, we, we can also go uh, from there to, to, to other directions, right? Once the private funding comes into space exploration. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I mean, uh, that's that's what I think that, okay, I can share the links I and I hopefully people will watch it, listen to it, uh, and uh, they will help you with your uh, efforts and uh, they will understand probably your excitement that which is there. It's, it's great. Uh, so thank you so much, guys, uh, for doing this, uh, sparing your time and uh, sharing all the interesting work that you guys are doing. So thank, thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Um, it was a pleasure. My pleasure. Yeah. Bye. Bye.